he is now he have uh, very active in written some publication related to the COVID for the UNS Cup. And also before the current position as the director, he was also working for UNEP, for the Division of Technology, Industry and Economic in UNEP in France. I think I would like to give the space to Dr. Stefanos to give the presentation. The time is yours. Uh, thank you very much, Andreas. And um, of course, thanks uh, very much, um, uh, Minister Paksafri and, and uh, all the speakers. And uh, I would like to congratulate um, uh, the ministry for, for this initiative, because I think it's extremely important uh, to show in, in this very difficult time uh, agility when it comes to, uh, to, to the response from, uh, in, this, in this global pandemic. So what I would like to do um, in the next uh, 10 minutes is just to go through, uh, and I will start sharing my presentation now, but uh, it's very short, uh, only four slides. So um, I hope you can see the presentation. So what I would like to do is just share some thoughts on uh, how ESCAP has approached uh, the recovery to the COVID-19 and the work we do with member states. I will focus on the environment part because uh, it is an important part of the response. So in the very early days of the pandemic, ESCAP published a document on the socioeconomic impacts in the response of um, ESCAP to this pandemic. And actually we focused on three big areas. One was uh, what uh, we see it's the impact on the economy. Uh, the second is what is the impact on the social structures. And the third was what is the impact and what are some messages we want to use for the environment. Because, uh, and, and why we focus on the environment. Because, you know, the first days of the pandemic, um, we started listening some messages that um, some coastal areas are recovering and you see species going back to, uh, to, the, to the ecosystems. Uh, we listen that um, air pollution is getting better. The greenhouse gases are, are getting lower. And we were thinking, and as an environmental uh, professional, I was thinking that this is great, but we cannot celebrate. We cannot celebrate that we have reduction of air pollution because we have people not, walk, not going to the war. So we, we, we started to see what could be the impact on, on environment. So we came with, uh, first of all, a set of recommendations on uh, how environment could be embedded in the policy response to the COVID-19. And one is that uh, we need to ensure that all these policy measures, the fiscal stimuluses, are grounded in the commitment to sustainability. They are looking on how they could enhance the implementation and acceleration of the 2030 agenda and of course, how they can address the biggest, the much bigger disaster that it's coming, the, the disaster that it's related with the climate emergency and the climate change. We also said that uh, uh, we need to see how the stimulus packages could be also environmental related, uh, how we can use regional cooperation uh, to recover from the crisis, thinking that the environment has no borders, that what happens in one country affects other countries and vice versa. And also we have seen that uh, it's, it's a big certainty that the pandemic of COVID-19 has been happening because of a not proper relation between humans and wildlife. So we need to, to, to see again how we interact with wildlife. So why we think that it's important of these things to happen in Asia Pacific? Because if we see, and let me go a little bit now on the general level, if we see what is the environmental situation indicators in Asia Pacific, we cannot really be very happy about what's happening. So in, in the region, we, dis, we consume about 50% of all resources that they needed for economic activity in the world. We produce about one third of the economic output and just these two numbers, they do so the inefficiency of the production and consumption system. We are producing so much waste 
we have the biggest numbers of deaths from air pollution. And if we look at the coastal and ocean ecosystems, we see that we have such disruption that uh, many experts, they say that it, it might be non-recoverable. Uh, mangroves have been lost by more than 60%. And if I'm not mistaken, their projection saying that if we continue with the business as usual scenario, by 2050, we might lost um, more than 80% of the mangroves. So we were thinking, and this is comes the first element that I would like to, uh, to talk about on the substantive uh, kind of thoughts we have in ESCAP. What could be the main entry point on recovery and a recovery that is sustainable and it is promoting the 2030 agenda and the Paris Agreement? So we thought that this is a crisis health and um, this is a health crisis, sorry. And health is the entry point. But to approach it from a point of view that looks more holistically, we, we thought about the issue and the concept, we call it the planetary health. So planetary health is um, something that has emerged about 10 years ago, uh, no, 20 years ago. And it's a concept that says that planetary health is a combination of the health of humans, the human civilization, and the state of the natural systems on which this health is dependent. And what is a very big underlying factor behind the concept of planetary health is that we should have, although we don't have, a symbiotic relation between humans and ecosystems, and particularly the ocean, which is the bigger regulator of climate. It's one of the bigger pro providers of economic activity, as you have uh, shown, Andreas, in, in your slides. So um, from, uh, from an ecological science point of view, humans are part of ecosystems because we are species that we're working into the ecosystems. But it seems that we have forgotten this symbiotic relation and we have broken it. And we, by, bro by broken this symbiotic relation, we have created a number of impacts, including this health crisis with the COVID pandemic. So how we can start um, actually uh, building back this symbiotic relation? Uh, we need, uh, I think, first to um, do what very recently the Secretary General of the United Nations uh, mentioned that we need to stop harmful environmental practices and the subsidies that would support them. The Secretary General has made a very specific um, mention on stopping all fossil fuel subsidies. Um, he was very explicit in, in, in his message. He didn't ask for a rationalization of fossil fuel subsidies or for a reduction, he asked for stopping the fossil fuel subsidies. We need to see also not only the fossil fuel subsidies, we need to see other subsidies like the uh, bad fishery subsidies that they are uh, actually harming local communities, coastal ecosystems, and the marine environment and the ocean in, in general. Um, and, and if we look at uh, the, the magnitude of the numbers when it comes to the subsidies, um, we will understand that, uh, first of all, it's a big amount of money, but second, the problems that this money are creating are much bigger on a monetary term from what they try to solve. So there is an estimation, for example, that for every dollar that is spent on fossil fuel subsidies, there are six dollars of impact on health and well-being that is happening for all the people. So if we want to achieve this kind of planetary health, one of the first immediate measures, and I think this is the time to stop the, the subsidies on fossil fuels because with the price of oil being quite low, this gives the fiscal space to governments to not uh, promote other subsidies. But at the same time, we need to start taking the nature into account. Um, and um, I know that many environmental economists, they will say, fine, let's start to monetization of natural resources, let's put uh, the natural ecosystems, let's give a value to the natural ecosystems and put it in our models. But I think that this is probably not the right approach. The right approach is that we use what we call the physical capacity of ecosystems, the physical capacity of the ocean to frame finance policies. So it's not about assigning a value to uh, or a monetary price to a good or service that's coming from the ocean, but it's about respecting the 
physical capacity of the ocean to sustain life and then take these limits that they are coming from the physical capacity in order to uh, design and implement uh, fiscal and finance policies. The second point is that we need to see the relation between climate change and the ocean. And um, this is another area that we believe there should be a very big amount of water can happen. So um, ocean and climate are very intrinsically related. And actually this year, the year 2020 has been presented as a, as a green year because we were expecting to have three big uh, global conference this is the ocean conference uh, supposed to start next week in, uh, in lisbon but now postponed the big biodiversity cop uh, in china and also the cop 26 in in the uk all of them are postponed but i think uh, while the conference are postponed it's not the time to postpone action in these areas so we we use the covid 19 pandemic to draw seven specific lessons on what uh, this pandemic can learn to us about the way that we should look at the relation between climate and ocean and how to address uh, the issue of climate change and ocean degradation. One is that um, we need to put science and scientists first. We saw that uh, in the COVID-19 pandemic, scientists became coming together. They forget about national borders and, and, and national uh, political differences. And they responded together. They accelerated the response and the accelerating right now the speed with which uh, research is happening for a vaccine or for cures. Um, and you know that when it comes to ocean and climate, there are so many reports and so many important reports that they have been produced by the IPCC. Um, and unfortunately, I have to say that sometimes these reports have been put under negotiation. So while uh, the global response to climate and the global response to the conservation of ocean is part of international negotiation under the UN. I don't think that science can be negotiable. So we need to start with the science and take all the messages and then design policies. The second lesson is that uh, we need to adopt the whatever money it takes approach when it comes to the conservation of the ocean and climate after the COVID. There was a very nice and correct response from all the governments and they said we are going to invest money to ensure that people will have access to healthcare, to ensure that economy will not completely collapse, to ensure that small and medium enterprises are getting support. So we need the same approach uh, to put whatever money it takes to conserve the ocean and the climate. The third is that we saw from the COVID that countries that they have invested in the common goods of health, of clean air, of clean water and sanitation, they responded better to the pandemic. So we need now, when we are going out of this pandemic, if we want to address the ocean and climate issues, to protect and improve the common goods that are supported by the ocean, the climate regulatory uh, function of the ocean, the food provision uh, function of ocean. We need also uh, to see uh, that we need to focus on the ones that they are already left behind. In, in the case of the COVID pandemic, the people left behind were people that they didn't have access to healthcare, they didn't have access to proper facilities, they were living in necessary houses. So in the case of ocean conservation is the poor coastal communities that we should start looking at them when we have recovery. And a fourth, a fifth element is that to make fisheries and other ocean um, good and service value change climate resilience, because we saw how the value change that they had to respond on the COVID, like the transport value change, the tourism value change, they was not resilient enough to, to get the crisis. Out of these value changes, we need to uh, really focus on the food systems because when it comes to our response to ocean and climate, fixing the food systems could provide, um, I, I don't want to give a scientific number, but I would say a very big part of the solution. And last but not least, and I will be closing um, on, on this slide and then my presentation is that uh, when it comes to the conservation of ocean uh, and the climate, we need to ensure that credible information and not fake news are lead the public discussion. Uh, we saw how much disruption happened with the COVID-19 pandemic because of the fake news and uh, we need to take this lesson on confronting the ocean. So let me finish by first of all thanking uh, one more time all of you and saying that um, a sustainable Climate compatible recovery from COVID-19 is not just the politically right thing to do, 
but it's the effective and efficient way, uh, it's an effective and efficient thing to do. If the response will achieve acceleration of SDGs and the Paris Agreement, then we can say that the sacrifices and the investments that they have gone on this recovery, they have created multiple benefits. Thank you uh, very much. Uh, thank you, uh, Mr. Stefanos, to give us some uh, brief information. Uh, you are trying to link that the COVID uh, is as important as the climate change issue. Just maybe the climate change issue uh, is not uh, is slow, some kind of like a slow onset, ongoing now, but uh, rather than the COVID is just like uh, very snapshot like this and then everything just coming uh, to the surface and people getting panic and how to solve the problem and actually we are agree with you that we need to solve all the problem step by step and every country has own a uh, policy how they could implement how to how to solve the problem starting not only for the COVID-19 but as well for the climate change issue related to the ocean. Thank you, uh, Dr. Stefanos, for give us some information. We come to the second uh, speaker, uh, Dr. Safi Burhanuddin. Uh, uh, Dr. Safi Burhanuddin is the Deputy Minister for Maritime, uh, Connecting Ministry for Maritime Affairs and Investment of Indonesia. Uh, I think uh, he has a long history working for Ocean uh, since uh, I think early 2000. He is uh, head of the Research Center for uh, Non-Living Resources under the Ministry of Marine Affairs and Fisheries. And also he's a lecturer at the Hasanuddin University until now. And he has a background on uh, marine uh, geologies. But now I think he is not talking about the scientific, but he's more talking about the policy because he's the deputy minister. He's not the scientist <laughs> anymore at the time. So I would like to... Uh, uh, give the opportunity to Pak Safi to give some uh, information about the, how is the national policy related to the uh, blue economy uh, after COVID-19 for Indonesia. The time is yours, Pak. Silakan. Thank you, Pak Andreas. Good afternoon, everyone. Very good afternoon. Uh, thank you. I just to, to emphasize what the doc, do, Dr. Stefanos mentioned. Make sure that the credible, we have to ensure the credible information, not fake news. Because during the uh, COVID-19 pandemic, so many fake news, so this is a good time to, to make sure that this, this is not a fake news. So I we had the seminar. <clears throat> okay, in, uh, in the point view of the government, let, let us start, please continue. Let us start talking about what's the impact of the COVID-19 about the global economic uh, growth. If you see here, <clears throat> Indonesia just, just talking, if you see the most now, if you see most the video, in, in outside, during the during the COVID nineteen, the sky is become more blue, and there's so many wild animals coming to the city. For the environmentalists, it's a good news. But this is how to make make it. It's what's called it, uh, balancing with the the environment and the city can still uh, move. In the global economy, we can see here the project the global economy from four institution financial institution predict is about the negative. Yeah. Uh, global economic growth in 2020 and then in general for the country they did the, the, the negative but negative was one percent if we see here that slide show I just slide so far yes we see here the globe and then we can see what what about the Indonesia what about the other is the financial institution look at Indonesia World Bank, ADB, Moody's, and also mentioned about the, the, the economic growth in Indonesia is about, in general, it's about uh, one or two, two percent. So, World Bank is almost pretty in the, in the negative. But in 2021, there's a rebound in Indonesia, and then they the, the become the, the positive from about, in general, about five percent. Some IMF predict until 8.2 percent, the growth economic. Uh, economic growth in Indonesia, economic growth in Indonesia. And we can see also the effect in Indonesia of the mentoring partner. In general, we can see 2019 and then it, uh, the decline 2020 and a rebound again 2021. Next, please. 
So when we talk in the blue economy, so many, so many uh, uh, sectors, so many uh, blue economy encompasses so many, so many sectors. So we have, we want to focus in the fisheries and aquaculture. Next, yes, we have, we have been talking in precise about fisheries. Now. Look at this map. This map is about the fisheries management area in Indonesia. It consists of eleven uh, fisheries management area. And let's look at the red cycle, a biggest, a big, big one, and become a small one. Biggest is the, the, the bigger impact from the COVID, and then the small one. You can see the biggest is coming from in Jakarta, and in Java in general. Out of Java is in South Sulawesi. We can see what's the impact directly the COVID-19. Decline of fish price that dropped dramatically by 50% in national fish import. This is a big issue for the fishermen because the price is dropped 50%. And, and the impact is also the fishermen income from 3 to 5 million to, to become 1 to 1.5 million rupiah. At once, they went to the sea. And also the decline, of course, also the fish prices due to lockdown. You can imagine the lockdown of the impact is the impact of the lockdown is not just the city, it's also including the restaurant. If the restaurant is included also how to order the, the, the fish. Next. Look here. If you hold the table here, the diagram, we can see also the, 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 the comparison about uh, the table between the blue and the orange. It, it is between the, the failure in March 2020 and the June 2020. In general, 28 to 29, the, 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 what you call it, the production is increased. You can see the decrease from June to March, June to March. But this year is decreased. It's also uh, in link with the, the, the price, the failure of the product. In June, 28, 29 is the increase the failure, and but in, in 2020 is decrease the failure. If we compare after the, the, the price comparison after COVID-19 period 2019 and to April 2020, we can see in general the reduction is about 10% of the price size. It is this example of the, 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 the screen size of 20 per kg and 200 per kg. In general, the decrease, uh, the reduction is about 10%. Next. And if you can see the cold storage capacity, we can imagine also the cold storage capacity is limited, just about 340,000 ton for general. It's, it's included for fresh peas and processed peas and also their stock. And you can see so many product type of fresh, fresh peas and processed peas. But our estimation this year, our estimation this year in June is about 2 million and 252 and 1,980,000 ton. It means if there is no circulation of the product, and we have the overcapacity, and there are many fish cannot be put it in the cold storage. That is the big issue also about the, the capacity of cold storage, because the the, the what you call it the, the capacity of the market is, is limited. Next, look here. What what about the fisherman loss and are able to meet the basic needs? We understood also. It's about more than 2 million fishermen and fish farmer household in Indonesia. And you can see that the fishermen is about 2 million, fish farmer 4 billion. If we see the number of fishermen, sea fishermen and inland fishermen, we can see here a little bit increase from 2015, 2016 to 2019. And we can see also the, the number of joint venture cooperation, cooperation. It's like a cooperation in Indonesia. And there's a village of fishermen village about 3,000. If you see here the, the, the graphic, there is the, the number, the color is yellow, green, and grease. We can we can see here the in the the, the the yellow one is the average income in general. The green the green is the in sea income average and the inland. In general, we can see the sea income average is bigger than the inland, and in general, it's about 3.85 in 2019 the average of the income of the fishery. So the growth trend 2015 to 2019 is in general, it is increased 20, 54% per year. Increasing of sea fishermen income by 23. Increasing of inland is about 10 to 13%. It means there is a big prospect from the sea fishermen to increase their, what's called their income. Next. 
look here what about the export decrease it's it's total in line when when there is the impact of the COVID. The, the export is limited, is decreased. Why? Because the transportation is the problem, the tourism is the problem. You can imagine there is there is not many uh, the sea transportation. There are many uh, sea uh, what's called airline to, to 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 transport, and so many restaurant is closed. So why the, the order is become a redu big reduce? This is the big problem. So we Indonesia also know to increase how to to make a balance because the. The, the foreign uh, need is the decrease, so we ask now is the the domestic uh, we increase the domestic need. Next. So why now we we propose what's called management based on fishing management area right, or national planning. We understood Indonesia has eleven uh, fisheries management area. Traditionally, when we talk in the fisheries management area, we're just talking about the capture fisheries. But now we have to change because we're talking the blue economy. It's not just a point view of the blue capture fish, but we are talking also the uh, aquaculture. We're talking also about the industry. We're talking also about the tourism. We're talking about the other. So this is this part integrated. So fishery management area and national planning on 2020, 2020 and 24 must be something that's more integrated, not just thinking. So we will build, the government will build the area. We made pilot project by the area. It's, it's included not just the port for the fish port, it's included the uh, international port for the for the cargo port, and also in, including the airport. It's built for the cargo because it, it's included in transportation facilities. Included how to uh, make sure that the facilities of the need, electricity need. It's always many area, many in, in the area, in the, the remote area, there's a problem about the electricity. But when we're talking now the how to manage based on fish management, now we're talking more complete, more integrated uh, proposed. Next. So this this is some example. Now we, we are now develop what's called solar PV mobile. Most of the area, in, especially in remote area, we develop this one. The Minister of uh, Fisheries order agree. We have some visitor of the some industry, and then we develop in Indonesia because we think it is not so a high technology. And so we understand how some the university can do it, and some the local uh, uh, state-owned company can do this one. Just make it the capacity, and then we can put it in this uh, in the some the, in remote area. And other is millennial screen farms. This is a, this is a farm special to black mobile. Then the diameter is about 10 until 20 meters. Then it's easy, you can put it in your backyard and with the, some uh, what's called technical assistance the per government. And it's very, very, what's called, very innovative. Then we can provide even small, small area. This is one of innovative avocado we can we can develop, especially how to increase the, what the, the president said we have to increase to 250% uh, the uh, volume of the export, especially in screen. Next. So, during the during the COVID nineteen, we have to need an economic recovery program for fishermen, especially. First, if we came the fishermen services, what look like a bucket social, and the second, we have the funding corner that makes some uh, submission facilities for fishermen funding. The set we make sure the certification of fishermen land right. So many so many land is not being made to make sure that what the fishermen where do they stay, they have the fishermen land right. What you call it. And then the fourth is a rehabilitation of fishermen village. Most of the fishermen village almost is loosey. Something is very dirty. Now this is this target. And now this year we have some program for in a base uh, uh, funded by the uh, APBNP or by, by the government and 40 location will be funded by CSR. This is in, in, in this year. So we'll continue uh, next year. As you, we mentioned before, at least we have 3,000 uh, fishermen village in Indonesia. Fifth is the diversification of fishermen business. Business is mean the coachman fishermen and their family and fishermen not just depend on what they use as, as business as usual, but we give the other. It's been like a, what's a failure added what they the product. And uh, last but not the empowerment of the venture of cooperation. We have some what's called uh, uh, law of the interest of them, and we can give uh, the government can give by the minister to facilitate out of can they uh, can continue. Next. And last but not least, this government policy, how to support marine and fishing sector facing COVID-19. First, it's about stockpile and fishing port and fish auction place. It's now, national policy in the form of discounted shipping costs for fishery products that are distributed using online system. So many now, it's called the startup. 
like Aruna, like Pison, and others to, to continue because we understand not, not many people can move. So I the, uh, the flow what's called the online system. Accelerate also the placement of cold storage according to the availability of this stock. Because the problem is uh, there are some areas, the stock piece is abundant, but not many, to, not, not enough the cold storage. This is, this is how to accelerate the placement. The second about the low price of piece and screen. Because the low price, now we are supposed to the head of the local government, especially to the government, region major, to allocate this budget, their budget through the local budget yeah. to purchase fishing, fisheries product. This it means also we have to ask also to to uh, to socialize the the gemar ikan. We understand also the our, our the capacity gemar ikan now is about 50 kgs per per capita per year. We want to increase. If we can do like this, we can reduce the number of import of the meat because the meat we uh, import a big one, so we can ask from the local government to increase consumption of the fish, local fish. Another relaxation of credit restructuring for fishermen, of course, fish farmers. The Celtic fishermen suffer loss and able to fulfill to fulfill basic needs. So why now we the from the government policy, government assistance to for fishing communities, fish farmer and processor other and salt farmer, that's our, our destination, our target, and other is direct cash assistance, we call BLT for fishing community, fish farmer. It we just talking about in the cabinet is about two million people. It's for the fishermen, it's about 1.08 million people is directly what's called involved in the what's called uh, direct cash assistance, right? some support for direct cash assistance. And they will get about 600,000 per month for three months. And other labor intensive program in the aquaculture sector, there's in seaweed, milk fish, shellfish is, is more for the world's quality for product, product carrier. And fisheries export are declining. To 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 help this one, the the decline of air cargo rate and addition on cargo surface. So we, we just invite we discussed of the air cargo how to reduce the, the price of the air cargo to, to make the the balance of the price and to easy of marine and fisher product logistic distribution. Last but not least, the tax incentive for marine and fish industry. Expense of the scope of the Minister of Finance regulation. So based on what tax tax have done now, of course it, it takes a time, and we can see after June, after September, we can see the result. So you, you can see here now we understood also blue economy is very important for a nation country like the archipelago country. So why this is like our uh, like what's our, for the, for the our ultimate goal? How to make it the blue economy is become what the major movement of the, the prime mover economic in Indonesia. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Thank you. Brief information about what is the strategy of Indonesia with uh, new security, the imbalance distribution between uh, demand and supply, and then you trying to to explain to us how is the exit strategy, what is already has been done by the government of Indonesia through the national policy, and also to get involved with the local government all over the province in Indonesia. Uh, Thank you, Pa Safri, for your uh, explanation. So before we come to the next speaker, uh, Dr. Russell, uh, I would like to let you know the, to the audience that uh, we will share all of the uh, presentation through the, a link that can be, be saw at the end of the this uh, webinar. So you can maybe you can wait until the end of the this meeting, and then we can uh, share the link. After that, and as well uh, for those who would like to have a e certificate, uh, just type your name and your email address on the either if you are in the YouTube, you can just type on the message, or if, if you are doing the Zoom, you can just type also your name and your uh, email address, just like that, as easy as that. So. Uh, at the moment, we have about uh, almost uh, 500 uh, participants through the Zoom and then more than uh, 100 uh, participants uh, through the live streaming through the YouTube. 
So it's about uh, more than 600 uh, uh, audience that uh, joined uh, our meetings uh, this afternoon. So I would like to introduce the next speaker, uh, Dr. Russell Rice Hull. Uh, he is currently representing the Australian uh, Prime Minister for the uh, as the Serfa Group for the High Level Panel for a Sustainable Ocean Economy. Uh, he has a background experience in the marine science, fisheries, uh, marine safety, MPA, ocean policy, and many things related to the ocean. I think including climate change. And he was the chairman for Great Barrier Reef, uh, Mark. Uh, Marine Park Authority, and also the CAO of the AIMS, Australia Institute for Marine Science. I think, and also he has uh, several experience working in Indonesia, including with the ATSI project, uh, Arafura Timor Sea Expert Forum, ATSEF, in the early 2000, I think, when the Ministry of Marine Affairs and Fisheries starts. Uh, thank you, Dr. Russell, for, I think, you are a big list of the experience on the ocean issue. Now, I would like to give uh, the time for you to give us some information related to this uh, presentation this uh, morning, afternoon. Thank Please. you very much, Andreas. Uh, and thank you all for um, joining the webinar. It's a great uh, privilege to be speaking to you and working with my colleagues. Uh, I, I would like to use my short time to talk to you about the international aspects and the need for global cooperation uh, about resetting our relationship with the ocean as humanity and the ocean um, and uh, it's all to do with people people and the resilience of people and communities as well as the healthy ocean building with nature so the short version uh, for what we need to do is for the ocean protect produce and restore that's the uh, the motto of the next slide please I'm uh, working with uh, um, colleagues from 14 countries. Uh, you can see them there. Hopefully you, you all can see the slides. Australia, these are alphabetical order, okay? Australia, Canada, Chile, Fiji, Ghana, Indonesia, Japan, Kenya, Mexico, Namibia, Norway, Palau, and Portugal. Uh, it's a very diverse group of countries that all have significant ocean estates. Uh, they, um, in the list of uh, the, those countries, some are uh, what used to be called small island states. Uh, my colleagues in Fiji and Palau like to call it large ocean states. So that's their, their name for their countries. Um, the goal, uh, and by the way, Peter Thompson, um, Mr. Vanos, is the UN SecGen's special envoy for the ocean, is also a supporting member of the panel. And he comes to all our Sherpa meetings as well. So we're doing, uh, it's meant to be two years work, um, and uh, I'll, I'll just run through what's been happening. But um, the two years is going to be extended because the conference in Portugal, the UN Ocean Conference, uh, has been postponed. So we're not sure now how, but the goal is very simply, uh, what can these 14 leaders, and I emphasise the members are the leaders, the serving leaders of these countries. Um, and so um, in my case, uh, Prime Minister Turnbull um, took on the uh, agreement with uh, uh, Prime Minister um, Sulberg from Norway, but uh, now is Prime Minister Morrison. So these are people, uh, they're not negotiating a treaty. They are looking for finding practical policies that will help their people who they represent and that uh, will um, uh, work on the issues of uh, the contract between humanity and the sea. It's a very broad topic. Um, the conversations uh, in the last year, well, don't forget, in Australia, we started with the worst drought in a century and then the worst uh, bushfires and now the pandemic. Uh, so um, there is a kind of sense that we need our relationship with nature is not right uh, and we need to uh, do things differently. Clearly, uh, the COVID um, has, if anything, uh, increased the urgency of action in the ocean to... Uh, Put in place uh, things that will protect people, uh, and um, it, it, it's um, it, it's too early to say anything about the silver lining. But it, what what the COVID has shown us is that humanity across the globe can respond quickly and strongly in the face of uh, severe risks like the pandemic. 
And I agree with uh, Andreas, uh, who said earlier that um, we need to have that sense of urgency, even though uh, things like climate change and the decline of ocean resources happens more slowly, uh, it is still too fast. And we need to apply the same uh, commitment as we are applying around the world to stopping the pandemic. And uh, we need to apply that to some uh, health of the ocean issues. Some of the issues uh, are old issues like marine pollution, overfishing, Climate change is, sadly, it's still an old, it's an old issue now. We've known the science for a long time and habitat loss. The thing is, uh, and um, if there's no change, we will not achieve the sustainable development goals that relate to hunger, to health, to jobs, to energy, sustainable communities and global partnerships. So that's the, um, the commitment of the, the leaders uh, is to um, work together to do um, uh, agree on some major actions and changes that can occur in this relationship. I can't report on them yet because we haven't finished the work, but the issues are ones that you can imagine. I listed the marine pollution, overfishing, climate and habitat loss. Um, they, they remain issues. What we need is more effective ways to deal with them to meet those SDGs. Um, one of the things that's already happened after the climate um, uh, the uh, yeah, could I go next slide? Thanks. After the um, at the UN Climate Summit, uh, the leaders released a, a call to the to the other member countries of the UN for ocean-based climate action, and um, it, it was um, it was a, at a time when more commitments are being sought by the UN uh, Secretary General, as as was mentioned earlier. Some of the ones that were uh, announced in the media from the panel representatives uh, secretariat were to um, scale up ocean-based renewable energy, decarbonize shipping and transport, protect and restore blue carbon ecosystems and, and develop low carbon, low, low footprint sources of protein from the ocean uh, and including things like uh, um, non-fed aquaculture, the, the oysters and uh, seaweeds, for instance, um, are also uh, not to be uh, left out. Uh, the uh, analytical work that was done by some um, a group of scientists, uh, not the panel itself, uh, showed that 21% of the emission reductions needed to achieve the 1.5 degree limit goal of uh, the Paris Agreement could be delivered through these four areas of ocean-based climate action. It, it points to the ocean as a solution, not a victim of of climate change. Um, so could I get the, the next slide, please? This is just an example of the kinds of things that are being thought about. And this was uh, announced in the Oslo meeting last year. And I think I don't think it was discussed in the Bali meeting uh, where President Widodo attended that meeting in the uh, end of 18. Um, this is a cooperative research center and it's got an interesting conjunction of some of the elements that of the blue economy. Uh, and and it's, um, it's combining uh, the technology for offshore engineering, deeper water uh, aquaculture, uh, because, and, and renewable energies uh, from various sources, uh, and also um, the, the sort of the enhanced engineering skills. So seafood, marine production, offshore engineering, renewable energy. And it's attracted quite a lot of 45 partners from around the world. It's come from a research group but it's really research and industry working together. And uh, that's just started this year. That's an example of the kind of cooperation and it's international uh, that we need to see more ways of, of taking old ideas, combining them in new ways that will um, but not only protect, address climate change and protect the ocean, but also um, uh, produce more uh, protein, food from the ocean. Um, next slide, thanks. This is my last slide and, and it's the message I, I wanted to um, test with you all and see uh, it resonates. I've, I've seen a number of webinars in the last several weeks that uh, one was uh, from the US East Coast, the Atlantic Council. Um, and and th those people were, were um, talking about the fact that you, the actions that we need to take to um, look after the, our, our well-being, you know, uh, more, more tree, trees in cities, uh, ch changes to uh, the air quality, for instance, uh, are, are build human health, but they also uh, restore some of uh, lost biodiversity. 
Uh, reforestation is probably one of the one of the best ways of sequestering carbon, and so um, you know it's uh, plants do a good job of it. So the and we've been busy uh, taking the plants away for hundreds of years. So uh, that that's been a common message. Um, but I, I would say that um, the other thing is that the, the experts in epidemiology uh, don't see this uh, corona, COVID-19, as the last pandemic. They see it as likely, we're likely to see more of these kinds of things, uh, given the rates at which humans and wildlife and so on are changing their, their interactions. Um, the, the action, the practical action, apart from treating the, the pandemic itself and, and the uh, people suffering from that, uh, it, and finish the pandemic as soon as possible, but do it by building human resilience and taking note of the things we can do differently and must do differently. Um, and, and lessons from the pandemic will show benefits in the broader environment. Um, it's urgent to address the well-being, human well-being globally with very basic needs, uh, shelter, water, food, employment, healthcare, reducing inequity within societies and between societies. And the, these are all issues that our, our Ocean Panel our members are very well aware of and, and talk uh, strongly in strong terms about needing to address these. Um, uh, in New Zealand colleagues and my Indigenous friends in Australia tell me, uh, I understand from long conversations with these First Peoples, like that they live in harmony with nature. They don't see themselves separate from nature or above nature. They, they, uh, they, uh, in Australia, they talk about their sea country they feel part of that. Their ancestors are in that sea country. That's their spiritual approach where they work with nature. And so that we could benefit um, around, depending on wherever we are, whichever country we're in, um, looking for these ways to work with nature, live in harmony, and, um, and, and in a way restore some lost uh, approaches when our, perhaps our population was much smaller on the human planet. And I've just given some examples uh, as areas where we would be helping the environment, the ocean, um, our human well-being, uh, and um, things like restoring degraded natural systems. Um, previous speakers mentioned the loss of mangroves. Uh, that's a classic. You know, it's a it's a blue carbon area, but um, they provide fish food. They provide uh, clean water. They provide protection from storm surge. Uh, they are a beautiful piece of green infrastructure or blue infrastructure that we should be restoring, not just uh, not preventing loss, but restoring. Uh, and millions of people um, experience food shortages and lack of shelter because of the loss of the mangroves. Revegetating uh, the seagrasses, um, as I said, it has these services, ecosystem services, clean water and protection. Uh, I, I also have been hearing about, this is not an oceans thing, but the uh, uh, increasing greening of cities is having a positive effect on air pollution as well. Um, the other one is restoring uh, primary production in the, in the ocean through reducing per pollution by fertilizers and pesticides, uh, the dead zone problem in some parts of the world, um, and the excess nutrients that are caused by erosion from poor land use, clearing the trees on the river catchments, for instance. Uh, so the land and the sea interaction is a very important one to address. Um, and harvesting natural resources in a sustainable and safe manner. Um, you know, the, there are practices in the global fishing industries in some places which are, are not just um, uh, uh, damaging the fish stocks, they are, they are impacting on human rights. There's modern slavery. There's um, very bad behaviour by some actors in the, in the fishing industry. And uh, I had a, a very productive meeting with colleagues from Jakarta in August last year uh, with Fiji and with Japan and uh, Palau in Canberra. And we talked about um, the kinds of things that we... Uh, would really, a few changes would really improve the, the fisheries uh, that we all are interested in. Uh, things like radical transparency, um, you know, uh, um, exposing poor behaviour by shining a, a spotlight on the good behaviour, for instance, uh, is very important. Um, so it's not just uh, offshore and perhaps uh, people uh, fish poaching and other things. Uh, it's, it's also um, how do you restore fish fisheries, fish available for, uh, in Indonesia, the coastal people who depend on it. And, and um, colleagues, uh, Park Safri talked about that, I think, 
as well. So th these sorts of things are good for the ocean. They're good for the people. Uh, and um, the mantra of the uh, panel is that you, you can't have, you must have a healthy ocean if you want a sustainable ocean economy. Uh, thank you, um, Andreas. Uh, I've finished. Uh, thank you, Russia, for giving us some information about the action of the most of the uh, member uh, of the high level panel and focusing in the what is the government of, of, of Australia really have been done during uh, this period. I think uh, later on, I, I, we would like to ask you uh, more information, how is the immediate action uh, coming from the member of the high level panels related to the blue economy. I mean, uh, to solve, especially in the for uh, recovery uh, of the uh, sustainability and then the livelihood in many countries, uh, member of the high level panel for the sustainable ocean economy. And thank you for, we come to the next speaker. Uh, would like to give a place to Andy Stephen. Uh, Andy Stephen uh, currently he is the research director for the coastal research under CSIRO Ocean and Atmosphere. CSIRO is the Commonwealth Scientific and Industrial Research Organization. is the Australian federal uh, government agency who has responsibility for doing research and also try to apply to the to the industry, something like that. Uh, 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 Andy Stephen also has some experience. Uh, I think he's doing the, uh, have some project uh, related to the Great Barrier Reef uh, on the E Reef. And also he has doing several projects related to the coastal and marine carbon biogeochemistry in many countries. And he's the expert panel for the UN High level panel for ocean sustainability and also several experience related to the ocean and blue economy uh, in the Indo-Pacific uh, area. Uh, I would like to give the uh, time to Andy for the presentation, please. Thank you, Andreas, and hello, everyone. Thank you very much for attending. Next slide, please, Aru. So, I'm sure you have many questions about, you know, what are the uncertain times we now find ourselves in a post-COVID environment? What does that mean for blue economy, whether you're working in an industry, whether you're a researcher, whether you're developing policy? On the left, there's a number of questions there that um, I and many of my colleagues have been thinking about, um, particularly in terms of what's the current status and what's the near future status and implications for the blue economy? What are some of the livelihood implications um, for those working in blue economy industries, but also more generally at regional and national scales, um, the flow on effects to food security has already been mentioned, supply chains, natural resource management. In the areas that I work in and some of you, um, what is, what's the R&D required to really support recovery and build resilience for nations, um, industries and communities? And then if we're going to really think about this from a systems level, what's the post pandemic scenarios and strategies given we had limited degrees of control over a number of things that have really been played out on the global stage. Um, for example, will we get a vaccine or not has a big, has a big determinant of, of how we will respond in the future. Lastly, I really want to come back to some thoughts around how do we sustain momentum for the blue economy as Russell's already said, we need to make sure that uh, that message keeps on coming through and doesn't get drowned in a number of the other issues um, that we as nations are going to need to face. So really Andreas has asked me to address um, two things. Firstly, I want to um, spend the first part of this talk is talking about some of the effects of the blue economy, particularly on Australia. Um, and then secondly, I want to come back to some of the short and medium term R&D requirements uh, for policy, livelihood and adaptation. Next slide, please. So I want to deal with um, two of the major industries. Tourism, um, as you know, is the biggest single sector in the blue economy. Um, and it's been profoundly affected uh, by COVID responses. 
certainly um, in terms of international tourist arrivals, this data provided by uh, UNWTO, the World um, Tourism Association, estimated that in the first quarter of this year, 67 million fewer international arrivals um, had come. And that's translated into $80 billion worth of uh, lost experts. And we see 100% in, uh, in destinations that now have travel restrictions. You'll note in that uh, graphic on the right that um, the area that's most profoundly affected has actually been the Asia Pacific region, which makes sense when you think that uh, COVID started uh, in China. So what does it look like going forward? Um, there are wild predictions around um, how long it will take to see recoveries. A lot of that really depends on when nations choose to open their borders um, and when we can, and subsequently when tourism operations can get back to, um, to going. Um, so the slide on the, um, on the, in the top panel show you a number of different scenarios that are really based on whether things were to reopen in July or September or, or later. There's a number of flow on effects um, that are estimated going forward, something like 850 million to 1.1 million dollar fewer tourist arrivals, um, more than 900 billion dollars um, to over 1 trillion dollars in lost exports, um, and, uh, and more than 100 million dollars lost at lost to uh, lost tourism. In Australia, um, we've had, of course, international travel bans for several months now. Non-essential uh, interstate travel has been banned. Nearly all, all of our tourism facilities have been um, closed and there's been a number of flow-on effects to, um, for example, the Great Barrier Reef was mentioned in the, in the marine park there, which relies on a, on a tourism um, payment that contributes to the operating. So there's a number of flow-on effects that really need to be thought about. Next slide, please. So when might we start to see tourism recover? Uh, as I've said, there's um, estimates that vary uh, and they depend very much in terms of when things can reopen. Um, the two slides on the right sort of show you the best guesses for resumption of international uh, travel as well as domestic travel. You can see that most pundits think that it's really not going to be until quarter three to quarter two or even into uh, the first quarter of 2021 before we're really going to start things to reopen. The panel down below in the left hand corner really starts is, is sort of zooms in on the slide I showed you before showing you what the different scenarios are that vary between 58 and 78 percent um, depending on whether it was in July or December as to when things would start to reopen. In Australia, we've had, as I've said, we've had businesses closed completely. We've had to provide, or the government has provided some funding for tourism recovery. Um, domestic interstate um, travel um, is starting to open over, open over coming months, but because everything is, uh, we're a federation, uh, different states are taking different approaches to that. We certainly don't see any international tourism in the foreseeable future. Next slide. I want to turn to uh, fishing and aquaculture as one of the mainstays for thousands of years of the blue economy. Um, but in the current context, then we're really seeing a number of um, demand and price declines that really everything has flowed, um, particularly since the first Wuhan incidents and how that uh, was placed very closely in relation to the Chinese new Lunar New Year, which occurred around January the 25th. Um, as a result of that, there's been um, very significant decreases in prices of restaurants, uh, as well as direct sales. Um, but this is, I would note, variable, variable by country. Um, and so it was very, really interesting to see the Indonesian numbers and just to compare what's happening there. One of the interesting changes, given that people were stuck at home and couldn't go to restaurants, is there's been a switch to frozen fish, which of course doesn't command as much price as, as live fish. Um, so that's that's also been significant um, as a trend. In terms of actual impacts on industry, they vary between offshore industries that are often, you know, like per se, and so are working in, um, in international waters versus those that are working in more coastal waters. Most of the fishing activity offshore has managed to main, maintain itself um, because they have onboard fish processing. Um, they can freeze, they can stay at sea and actually been safer for 
a number of them in terms of not coming back into ports. However, coastal fisheries, um, and it varies again by country, but up to 80% of fisheries have been closed um, in different countries. There's been a number of responses by different countries, including um, extending fishing seasons. But one of the other flow on effects has been that there's actually been decreased monitoring and compliance. Um, and as a result of that, we've, we've seen some increases, some upticks in um, illegal, unreported, and unregulated fishing due to this decreased monitoring. Next slide, please. Thank you. Um, so the flow on effects to supply chains, um, given that normal trade routes have been closed, um, has led to restrictions in terms of access to markets. Um, we've also seen fish farmers that are, because they can't sell their product, are still having incurring expenses in terms of um, maintaining um, fish farms, for example. Problems accessing uh, things such as food stock. Um, this is related to um, increased, as a consequence of this, many um, ships are now looking to transshipments at sea rather than coming into ports. This um, decreases, well, A, they can't come in, but B, also decreases the likelihood of transmission. At the livelihood scale, um, particularly for small scale fisheries and communities, um, they're profoundly affected. I want to come back to that shortly. And it's wow. already been mentioned in a number of the previous presentations, the importance of uh, this particular um, group is most vulnerable. We're seeing um, where people haven't got jobs, migration out of cities to coastal areas, which is increasing um, some fishing pressures, um, as well as other uh, coastal use areas. Where we've got overseas or migrant labour, they're unable to return to their jobs, um, and sometimes they've been stranded not to be able to get home. Um, and as a consequence of that, we're also seeing some increases in human rights violations. Next slide, please. So in the Australian context, um, we've seen, uh, particularly since China closed, uh, very significant declines um, in some of our primary industries, uh, primary products, rock lobster in particular, uh, which accounts for more than 50% um, of Australia's seafood exports, uh, dropped in price by 50 to 80%. Uh, uh, the value of our coral trout, um, has dropped uh, by fourfold from $60 to nearly $17. Um, and as a result of that, more than 90% of the fishery has been closed. Uh, moving forward, we're coming up to an approaching and limited export uh, window, uh, in term, particularly in terms of uh, tuna from April to September, when we typically export a lot of that product. So that leads on to a number of supply chain issues um, and more generally um, right across the food sector because Australia um, is such a significant um, food producer, produce, exporting uh, twice of what it imports. Uh, this, so this includes um, particularly getting product out. Um, many products have gone by, by, um, by sea and that hasn't been possible getting into ports. Um, Luckily, a lot of the seafood, more than 80% is air freighted, which has been a benefit, but that still comes at a great cost. And um, luckily, the Australian government has um, come to the fore here and provided $110 million through international freight assistance to make sure that we can keep some of those industries going. Next slide, please. So I mentioned the vulnerability of small scale fisheries. Uh, globally, they you know, employ more than 32 million people. Um, and um, another 60, 76 million dollars in post-harvest jobs. A lot of that catch is actually used for local consumption. Um, there's a really nice paper you can look for by Nathan Bennett um, recently out, and he summarised some of the negative consequences um, and positive consequences of what is what the implications of small-scale fisheries are. So some of those negative consequences obviously include um, shutdowns of industries and markets. Um, increased health risks, but some of the positive outcomes in terms of re-establishing um, food sharing, revival of local food networks, um, have really sort of really done a lot to help social cohesion um, amongst some of these communities. There's also um, a number of collective actions to really um, safeguard um, their rights, collaborations between communities and governments, um, and in some cases this has led to reduced fishing in some places. 
Bennett's paper goes on to advocate um, for different actors, the sorts of things that could be done to um, support the small, small scale fisheries and some of those are listed there. I won't go through them, but um, I think it's a really nice positive message in terms of a way to go forward. Next slide, please. So thinking about the short and medium term research uh, and innovation needs, um, really, I guess there's four key areas I think um, that need to be highlighted. The first one is that um, because of COVID, we're seeing critical gaps in observational records and getting good data is harder to attain. So in many cases, nearly all field work um, has been stopped, certainly in Australia, it has. The loss of international students, um, either stranded in home countries or unable to work um, is another compounding factor. We now have strict rules in place, um, not only social distancing, but respecting community safety and things like that, that really need to um, be better down and implemented. Many monitoring programs have been halted, um, you know, and even while we have a lot of instrumentation in the ocean these days, um, they still require maintenance and that uh, is getting, has been hard to do to date. Some of this, um, these deficiencies in data, not only the records, but they're in data poor regions, this is going to be a real issue. And so we're going to need more, you know, in terms of responding to policy, we're going to need to harness expert opinion more and more. However, I think we need to look at the opportunities from, from COVID, and I think we can't miss the opportunity in terms of collecting key data on, on changes that are occurring um, and the different pressures uh, we're seeing across the the whole socio-ecological system that comprises the economy. For example, you know, we, can we, you know, look at the recovery of fish stocks when, when fisheries are in port? What's the effect on protected and unprotected marine areas when we don't um, see the tourism numbers? Can we really look at the vulnerabilities of supply chains um, in terms of the immediate uh, economic, social and food impacts? Uh, next slide, please. So in terms of some research priorities um, and funding implications, um, of course, in the short term, um, we really need to harness whatever research we currently have out there to respond, uh, particularly to help communities in terms of the sorts of questions that they have. So this is action-oriented research. So we need to redirect some of that funding. However, in the medium term, the consequences of uh, the economic downturn um, and prioritisation really need to thought about that need to be thought about, and so you know, in terms of the priorities of different national governments as to you know what research can be afforded, uh, what has priority. Uh, I think we'll see how that plays out. And there's an opportunity there to for marine scientists in particular to really make that case and linking to the, the broader systems. Um, and that re requires a set of reflexive research, so research where we, where we self-reflect um, in terms of some of these broader safety, um, broader sustainability issues. The necessity to communicate our research and put that forward is, is I can't stress enough in terms of harvesting, harnessing the current, you know, well, at least in some countries, listening to experts, um, I think is not an opportunity that we should miss using poly, poly briefs, uh, media outreach, podcasts and the like to really communicate um, the science, the connection to, um, to policy, to the community is very, very important. Like the, like the medical industry, I think the releasing of, uh, of preprints of a lot of research before it's been through the peer review, I think given the situation um, is something that we can pursue and communicating um, virtually to uh, many of the research uh, remote communities that don't have access to life. I think we can, you know, I think we've all learned to do this. We're doing it today. Um, Next slide. So how do we map a lot about um, what some of those scenarios might be, the uncertain inherent in those um, and a lot of the people that are, are doing some of this modelling are thinking about uh, the different recovery types and timelines, and they give those different, um, describe them by different letters. So typically the V1, where you see a rapid decline and then a rapid recovery, 
uh, while people would like to see that, it's simply not going to happen, as Russell and others have said. Um, we then see ones with, with longer tails, such as the U response um, or the L response. But really, it's this one, the W response, where we're likely to continue um, viruses or pandemics will continue. But there's a number of important scenarios play out. What would be the influence of geopolitics why Chinese um, cooperation between countries, uh, for example? But really, what are the opportunities around and will the sustainability, sustainability narrative underlying uh, the SDG narrative? Ditto for climate change is, is the uh, far more solid. Um, how do we make sure that that's aligned um, with economic recovery? Will, will, at the national level, will countries take the opportunity to really think about will they focus on re-employment, um, where, for example, we could re-employ people um, to help with some of the, the um, building with nature um, aspects that Russell was talking about um, or retrofitting a lot of buildings to achieve efficiencies or will they focus only on a GDP? Enmeshed in, within that is what are going to be the, you know, at, at the national level or having to revise our visions of what we can become a good economy and change the government approach. Start thinking about what some of the vulnerabilities are. So, of course, there's different ocean narratives, and I've shown you um, some of the different ocean narratives. There is a, you know, as natural capital, as good business, um, as innovation. Um, but then we also can use these different types of scenarios to explore uh, what might be some of the, you know, what what are the what are the vulnerabilities of these ecosystems uh, and how we can go forward. Next slide, please. So here's just three examples of uh, the work we've been doing here. So in terms of thinking about those different scenarios, the um, graph on the right shows four different scenarios where we looked at um, looking at both the consequence of the pandemic and the level of cooperation, what, was, what would play out. So the four scenarios, they're related to sort of a quick recovery to normal, i.e. the free market one is where one uh, all. where government does take control and um, really as we've been talking about such as Improving um, sustainability in a fortress of which countries domestic sovereignty. So, um, in sectors, uh, we were able to look at a number. Yeah. 
activity as well as the tourist activities in Australia. I think this is already as well as happened in other countries like Indonesia or all for the world regarding the anyway, thank you for sharing also the information what is the short and the medium term of action that need to be done uh, by many countries in order to minimize or to or to have some recovery after the COVID uh, pandemic happened. Now we are coming uh, to the next speaker, uh, Carrie Ann Chapman from the World Bank. Uh, she is the, the World Bank Environmental Coordinator for the Papua New Guinea and Pacific Islands. I think he has a very uh, large experience in the new economy project in the eight Pacific Island countries. I think now I think he's uh, very active for the oceanic uh, fisheries resources, improving the sustainability of the coastal fisheries and associated ecosystem. Uh, Carrie and also has some experience uh, working in the many countries uh, from, sub, from the African as well as Indonesia some time ago and many, many countries I think here. Uh, I would like to, I think we are, have a good opportunity to hear how is the Pacific Island countries or ocean state in the Pacific region issue about the COVID-19 indoors. Andreas, thank you very much. It's and it's lovely to see uh, it's always such a pleasure to um, this, this evening, uh, I'd really like to, to talk about, um, could we have the, the first, the cover slide would be fine. Um, I'm really, really glad that, that I'm, I'm coming in a lot of the very early, the key points that we'll be discussing today with, with our large audience, really the, the living blue economy in the Pacific Island region, COVID or future COVID world, where the emphasis should really be on building back. Right, um, we've talked a lot about the tourism and the fisheries. Some emphasis on that. Um, could we go to the next slide, please? Yes, thank you. So in my presentation, it's going to be touching on four topics. One is natural disasters and climate change. As we know, because one of the most vulnerable regions in the world, we're going to now have an overlay of COVID-19. Um, the, the living blue economy. So we know that the ferocity of these natural disasters yeah. Extreme risks result in a very significant drop in GDP. The the estimates have run upwards of um, it's about uh, I think thirty percent or sorry yeah uh, it, it's upwards of uh, fifty sixty percent um, in terms of the impact on these natural disaster event and and the um, various losses that come from that. So building resilience, building stronger communities, building stronger economies to buffer these known extreme risks is one um, part of our broader program. And of course the broader program in the Pacific Islands uh, with various donor partners and in collaboration with uh, various countries, including Australia and New Zealand in particular. Um, on top of this, next slide, please. 
we have to, um, the impact of the coronavirus disease, COVID-19. And as of yesterday, 5 p.m. Uh, Eastern Standard Time, 141 days in, we have in a 24-hour period, 97,000 new cases confirmed, 4,900 deaths for a total of 5.6 million cases worldwide that have been tested and 355,000 plus deaths. Now, what's interesting about this table here is that there are 216 countries and territories that are affected today by COVID. 12 are not, and 10 of those 12 are in the Pacific. And the reason why, if we go to the next slide, is that in the Pacific, Samoa, for example, and Marshall Islands very recently had very shocking examples of epidemics. Uh, Samoa had the measles outbreak, um, and uh, Marshall Islands had dengue fever. And they had to lock down, they had to close down because the significant impact on their populations, which are quite small, uh, was fairly significant, very rapid. And so what you have is you have countries that are really on the precipice of massive um, impact in terms of climate change, but they were also the first ones to close down given their experience with these types of um, epidemics. And so they, in one way, really stepped forward very quickly, locked down international borders. They even locked down domestic borders out to outer islands. Um, to, to the extent that it's, it's been a great benefit because they're avoiding the, the disease right now. Well, what has happened, and a lot of the other speakers have, have touched on it, in terms of food security, in terms of the import of goods, right, including a lot of the food that they rely on, because in the coral atolls, you, there aren't opportunities to actually grow fruits and vegetables, for example. A lot of the coastal fisheries are decimated. So a lot of the food provision in these countries are not being flown in and they're not being shipped in. And this is becoming um, quite difficult. We know that these countries rely heavily on tourism and fisheries. In some countries, tourism is up to 70% of their GDP. In some countries, fisheries, particularly the, the tuna fisheries, can represent 60% of their GDP. And so I'll talk about this a little bit later. So what we have is on the health side, they've avoided it for now but how do they then open up their economies safely? And we'll talk about that in a minute. How do they start the engine of their domestic economy because of the uh, capillarity and interrelationship with the rest of the world um, related to their key exports, right? Fisheries and tourism. Next slide, please. So the World Bank team of economists has done a calculation that the range of GDP reductions due to COVID across the Pacific can range between 10 to 30%. Just in this term, it can be far more, um, uh, far higher should be absolute right now for most of these countries, um, should this continue in the six, 12 and 18 month period. Uh, many, many of these countries are waiting for a vaccine to be developed and proven. Um, others are looking at, could we open up uh, as part of the trans-Tasman bubble between Australia and New Zealand, it's being discussed right now, could some of the Pacific Islands join that trans-Tasman bubble as a COVID-free zone of international travel, since they rely so heavily on tourism from Australia and New Zealand, is that possible to directly bring in international tourists to specific resorts, to specific areas that are blocked off from the rest of the community. So there's a lot of creativity going on now in terms of how do you revive industries that have really collapsed quite immediately and quite swiftly. And you can see the impact on GDP. Now, how does this relate to the blue economy? If we could go to the next slide, please. We know that in, in the Pacific, the living blue economy is really looking at sustainable fisheries. This is the oceanic fisheries. Most importantly, the tuna fisheries, which equate about, uh, so it's a, significant stories. Uh, they have a very, very sophisticated system in tuna in terms of surveillance, in terms of combating IUU. The Persane uh, fisheries uh, is 100% uh, observer coverage on, on board observers, and I'll come back to that in a moment. The longline um, vessels, they only have about 5% coverage, and so the type of monitoring there for, for combating IUU is less. Um, but this in the oceanic world, this is, this is quite, the, quite important for, for their um, domestic um, growth. In terms of coastal fisheries and habitat degradation, 
in many countries, this has been fairly significant. And so what are the efforts um, in place to go to really near shore fad fishing, for example, or what are some other options to provide the protein source that Pacific Islanders are gonna require? Some of, the, some of the modeling has shown that the, the production of, of domestic fish for consumption is insufficient. And we're going to need to draw on the tuna fisheries to provide the protein input across the Pacific in the very near future, at, given the climate change impacts. And I think we, we all are quite aware of that. One area that we worked quite um, in Indonesia a few years ago, looking at leakage, uh, terrestrial leakage um, uh, in, in rivers in Indonesia. In the Pacific, it's a, it's a, it's a different part of the equation. It's the different side of the equation. And how do we treat not only the plastics that are uh, coming in from the Pacific Gyre or elsewhere, or even the products that are flown into the Pacific Islands, um, how do you deal with them? But in, in the Pacific, there's a legacy of nuclear waste. There's, there's asbestos in most of the construction. There are a lot of different waste um, elements, components that need to be treated. And each of these has a significant impact on coastal ecosystem health, coastal fisheries, um, and of course the health of the, of the citizens who are consuming these fish, right? So in terms of seafood toxicology. We're looking at nutrition and food scarcity. This is very important in the Pacific. We're looking at nutrition to have a better diet. Um, most of the food is, is imported um, and the, the healthy options, particularly for protein, um, would come from their local fisheries or from the near shore tuna. So these are some of the challenges that we've looked at. Could we go to the next slide, please? please? And I'd like to talk about some of the opportunities for recovery and resilience that the World Bank is uh, looking into now. When we think about um, what we can do today, uh, we've done in the World Bank, if you could go to the next slide, that would be great. Yeah, the opportunities for recovery and resilience, just one down. Yeah, that's perfect. Thank you. So, so right now in this immediate shock first phase, the World Bank has come in to really work on the health response in, in terms of really strengthening the health systems in country. So what type of health mat uh, sector materials do these countries need in case or when COVID does arrive on island, right? Um, the, the health systems are not uh, prepared for a pandemic level um, incident. And so the World Bank is providing them to strengthen their health systems before they open up, right? And this can be quite complex in terms of how the funds are channeled to purchase goods, how goods are actually arriving in country, um, people, the, 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 the staff on these vessels can't have the materials get off that vessel. So there are a lot of these very logistical, logistical specific complications that we're, we're working on right now. The second wave of response for COVID response in terms of economic recovery, particularly in the tourism fishery sector and building that greater resilience, we'll really be looking at how do we ensure that we create uh, an immediate wave of local jobs um, where people can shift into those local jobs? How do we um, buffer and, and support local livelihoods? How do we ensure that there's monitoring of coastal fisheries resources, right? Um, some of the other speakers, I think it was um, Steve and a few others who mentioned uh, the, the lack of monitoring, the lack of, of, of the ability to do monitoring surveillance activities um, in the fishery sector in particular because of the lockdown, because of the lack of travel. So what are some ways that we can work with um, the, the citizens in these countries to, um, to carry out this work? We also know that in, in uh, Micronesia, for example, there are the, the fisheries um, authority, they're taking the human observers off of the purse seiners to protect them um, from COVID. And so what happens now is, as other speakers have mentioned, the, in, the opportunity for IOU to increase without those um, uh, uh, human observers on board is quite significant. So in terms of introducing electronic monitoring, electronic reporting, uh, three camera systems um, that we're rolling out on the long line vessels, what are some opportunities to do electronic monitoring on the purseiners as well, since the human observers, they themselves have to have um, protection and are being removed. Um, so in our response, the first wave has been on health and ensuring the health sectors are strong enough should the pandemic come to these islands at some point. 
Um, the second wave is really looking at what are some innovative techniques that we could look at now. If we go to the next slide, I wanna to touch on one example that we have been piloting actually worldwide, but also in the Pacific, is that when, when we have a very strong program on um, pre and post tropical cyclone disaster incidents in the Pacific, this is, there's, you know, of course, cyclone season from November to April, um, these cyclones happen quite frequently. And so we use our drone technology during the cyclone recovery efforts and the, and the post-tropical cyclone, uh, cyclone um, disaster uh, reconstruction efforts. We're now using the same drones to really look at the, to capture data, to collect information um, uh, locally and in local communities during this actual COVID-induced lockdown. So using, using the drones that we have, using the remote technology to do the monitoring, to gather the data, to look at the health of the coastal ecosystems, to try to gather data on coastal fisheries, there, there's some um, unique ways of using the technology that's on the island right now to be able to feed some of these data to us. So we're, we're working with our clients very closely to look at how do we bridge a period where the purse seiners won't have human observers on board? How do we ensure that IEU is really being addressed uh, comprehensively? And then of course, collecting coastal ecosystem and coastal community data using our drone system. Just a couple of examples that I wanted to touch on. Um, if we could go to the next slide uh, on electronic monitoring and reporting. So here we're talking about the, the long line vessels. We're rolling out a, a, a very um, uh, important program to increase coverage on the long liners to combat the IUU, to make sure that the licensed vessels, which uh, comprise now 90% of the IUU that's likely happening, coming from these licensed vessels, and we need to make sure that the monitoring um, uh, systems are there. And so the, the electronic monitoring, electronic reporting structure that we're putting in place through our programs is definitely going to help. But now how can we bridge that to the purseiners should the impacts of COVID and as another speaker had said, um, a second wave of not only COVID, but a second pandemic coming um, as these um, viruses persist and, and new viruses come out in the future, right? We've seen in the last decade, I think, um, one or two uh, viruses really come out much more frequently than before. So what are the, what are the innovative uh, technologies that are out there that we can use and, and collaborate with our Pacific Island country clients to ensure that the work that's needed in the fishery sector remains robust and remains um, quite realistic in the operating environment under a COVID lockdown. If we could go to the next slide, please. I wanna talk about a little bit about innovative finance. So we know that, that for Palau and for um, Wanawatu and for Fiji, tourism is a, a big chunk of their economy and this has been decimated, right? It has really just closed down. So yes, it'll come back for sure. Um, but how do we want it to come back? And this is what I mean by building back better. We want the tourism sector to be about uh, sustainable tourism, very low impact, high value markets. How do we really capture the opportunity with this immediate shock and close down to come back better? How do we combat the marine pollution contribution of, of the tourism sector? How do we make sure that the impact is minimal? And how do we make sure that jobs are saved, right? And these are local jobs. So instead of importing a lot of the goods, can some of the goods be produced locally? Um, what are some new jobs that can be um, developed right now as the tourism industry is closed down? What are some options for the tourism um, staff that have been uh, put out of jobs? So this is, this is a real concern for, for of course, um, everyone in the Pacific, but for the World Bank, we're really working with um, the tourism providers to look at ways to employ these individuals so that they can have continued livelihoods. These are just some examples of what are the financial models available to provide a stronger comeback in the tourism sector. Um, in, the, in the final slide, diversification and growth um, in the blue economy. Uh, Kiribati out in the um, Central Pacific is comprised of three island groupings. And I think the exclusive economic zone is, is probably the largest um, uh, in the world in the sense that it's almost the equivalent of three exclusive economic zones. Um, in the line island group, the one furthest um, uh, east, 
uh, you have Christmas Island. And in Christmas Island, there's some very unique opportunities to develop a full blue economy. And this is in sport fishing, uh, pet fish for the aquarium trade, um, diving, uh, there's a bird sanctuary, and of course there are the, the solar salt um, uh, in, in the lagoon, solar salt production. So do you go into the gourmet salt industry? Do you produce salt at sufficient volume for the purse seine vessels? Could you have a transshipment hub out there in the Central Pacific? So there are a lot of opportunities in the Lion Island Group, particularly in Christmas Island. And so the work that we're doing there is how do we create jobs? How do we develop a really strong economy out there to support um, the, the population out there, but also to give Kiribati um, an additional boost in terms of diversifying its broader living blue economy. So these are just some examples of where the World Bank has come in, how we're working with our client countries, and some, some food for thought, um, and really building on, on the food systems, the food security, food sovereignty that Stefanos talked about, that Pasafri mentioned in terms of food security and food production in Indonesia. Russell, you mentioned um, protect and, and restore these livelihoods, healthy oceans. How do we do that? And Steve, I really liked when you talked about um, tourism impact and IEU. Uh, monitoring and of course um, referring to Bennett's paper I was I was really interested in to read that one as well and I really like that Bennett highlighted some of the positive um, impacts the silver lining that are that's coming out of this and we're very much seeing that so just to the last slide please so I just wanted to say terima kasih and um, thank you to all for joining today. These are just some ideas. Again, what I really wanted to talk about was building back better. There's an immediate shock right now. There's a near-term shock. There's a longer-term reality. And the Pacific really is bearing the brunt of this because not only of the climate change and cyclone impacts that are, are, are happening in, in real time, but also how do they come back and re-enter the world given that they are right now COVID free. And it's a very unique club of 12 countries that are COVID free in the world. How do we reintegrate them when the rest of the world opens up? So I will close there and we can go to the discussion. Thank you, Andreas. Yeah, thank you, Karian, for uh, give us very updated information mm -hmm. for the Asia Pacific, uh, for the Pacific region regarding the, what is going on in their area. Small islands country, but I think many get benefit from the ocean. So yes. I'm just wondering, I mean, maybe later on in the discussion, we can get have more information regarding uh, the next step of the Pacific Island state on doing uh, recovery after this pandemic. Uh, yes. I will uh, give the, uh, I have the co-host here, uh, Dr. Matt uh, van der Kliff. I think he will give some comment and also uh, question to the panelists regarding uh, what is uh, has been uh, discussed during the first session. The time is yours, uh, Matt. Please. Thank you, Andreas. So, uh, thank you to all the speakers. I, I think I particularly want to acknowledge that at the moment, with um, the restrictions we face and everyone working at home, I think it's been a, a magnificent effort. Um, and, a, and a set of really interesting presentations. And also, well, I've got the microphone acknowledging Andreas because uh, this webinar was, was Andreas's brainchild and, and it's been very inspiring. Thank you, Andreas, for, for organizing it and for coming up with the idea. We, I guess, to, to recap very quickly before we get to the questions, um, we started off with thinking about COVID and, and the first and most obvious impact of COVID is, is the impact on, on health. And the responses to minimize the impacts on health and, and to avoid an even bigger tragedy than the one that we've un seen unfold around the world is, is the, the response to impose a certain set of restrictions. And, and those restrictions then lead to another set of impacts, which are, which are primarily economic, but ripple, ripple at all levels. They've, they've impacted at, at a national level and impacted at all, sec all sectors of, of most countries. But they also impact at a local level. We, we heard from, from Andreas, we heard from, from Dr. Uh, we heard from Andy, we heard from uh, Dr. Safri how, how individual fish, uh, the prices have dropped and 
and each fissure in, in a strand of that in, in, in quotes, uh, things like Is it that can be part of that new contract? Well, well, several of the speakers have talked about. Well, let's first of all make sure that we leave no one behind. That's got to be one of the core principles. Let's respect the limits. Um, let's not take more than the nature can give. Then there are some other ideas that we can start bringing in. Decarbonisation was, was a very common theme. Things like, well, uh, think about alternative energy sources, but also maybe stopping some of the subsidies that, that are perhaps having a perverse outcome and making things worse than, than they really need to be. Then protect and protect what we've got and restore what we've lost. Those are, those are fairly fundamental um, actions that we can take. But one of the, the, the the, um, the pandemic has shown us is how rapidly we can act. And that has also been, been a thing. of action has been extraordinary. We apply that same, that, that same um, you know, commitment to um, part of that is going to be cooperation. That's, that's one of the aspects of COVID that we haven't seen, of course, as each, each nation. So cooperation is going to be an important part of it. So that's enough for me. And now it's time to, to open up to the panel, Andreas. Maybe I'll let you, you manage the time. First question that I'll, I'll address, or, or perhaps it won't about new normal it was a question right well what is going to be question that came a little bit later about um, you know what what's new normal when it comes to the fishing sector what's new normal when it comes to the tourism sector so for starters, I'm, I might throw to Dr. Andy um, because he talked about new normal as, as one of uh, several potential scenarios. And, and then, Andy, I wonder if you could throw then to, to Russell going from an over to you, Andy. Question. So, so yeah, if you recall in my presentation, I talked about um, a number of different scenarios and, and you know quite what that new normal is we don't know there's a high degree of uncertainty there's a number of uh, what I call bifurcation points that are really dependent on a whole range of things do we have nailed that, don't you? Is that right? what, what's the, the broader geo you know politics as Matt said what's the level of cooperation so we don't quite know what that new normal is, but the key to this, you know, I think is to be able to, is to navigate, you know, how do individual nations, how do individual communities navigate their way through this in a cooperative way um, that thinks about the, the broader system. So um, there's a range of mechanisms that have been talked about 
um, about how we do adjust to that new norm, a range of strategies in place for being prepared. As, as we see, you know, quite what the new normal looks like. You know, for example, will we see a second pandemic? Um, you know, what that do in terms of people's approach to, uh, you know, having further restrictions, things being closed down again. Um, does it take us over a tipping point in terms of the economy, um, particularly for some nations? I think all of those things are yet to, yet to play out. But, you know, I think Matt made a really good point around how quickly um, we've been able to, um, as a call for action, to adapt and, and how do we continue to do that while all, all the time exchanging ideas about different strategies, getting information, you know, the ability to foresight and think things through and so that we can anticipate rather than react, I think is going to be a key to how successful we are in navigating that new normal. With that, I'll stop and uh, pass to Russell. Uh, there we are. Oh, sorry, I was um, relaxing with the mute button. Um, yeah, look, on, on the um, the new normal, um, uh, look, th this is just a personal view. If I think of the things that was and things that are, are becoming evident, um, and, and thanks, Matt, you, you picked up on this sort of uh, lesson from COVID is how with the right cooperation, uh, things can change quickly uh, for the better uh, in, in these dire circumstances. I, I would single out a few things um, that that uh, really could be done better in terms of um, uh, how we deal with um, the ocean economy. Um, uh, the first one is money and finance, and it's Carrie Ann's world and um, how investment decisions are made. Uh, I think the um, you know the leadership that was shown by. Um, Mark Carney and uh, Bloomberg in setting up the task force for climate uh, uh, finan climate related financial disclosures T TCFD. Um, the um, you know it's a voluntary system of standards for de-risking investments, and, and I'm a strong supporter of um, doing the same thing for partnership. We saw in the Seychelles debt swap, you know, where T uh, TNC and was it the the bank Carrie Ann. Um, yep, uh, and um, they, uh, so an in, a big NGO and a big IFI, International Financial Institution, got together and the Seychelles debt, debt, no, sovereign debt, uh, and, and that's picking up now. Uh, that, so that's, that's a new model. And if, uh, if there was a way of coming up with standards for investment in public good, um, across um, ocean planning, for instance, and other things, then, um, you know, the, so quite a strategic shift in how the large amounts of funding is moved around for public good outcomes. And, and of course, uh, uh, blended finance with philanthropy is important, but um, I, I see an opportunity for encouraging standards in that area. So the UN principles on blue, blue finance, you know, the, has I got that right? <laughs> there are, there are principles take my word um, and um, uh, Peter Thompson talks about them a lot so that's that's one area um, the second one is I, I've worked in environmental uh, protection a long time and fisheries management and uh, I've never seen it be successful unless there was strong planning regimes um, and, and they need to be um, I, I come from uh, the great I, I, for 50 years or more I've been diving on the Great Barrier Reef and I've had the pleasure of working in its management recently. And uh, it's a strong planning regime. It's backed by the IMO with particularly sensitive sea area. It's, it's backed in with international and national level policies, but planning is needed to prevent the big bugbear of the decline of the ocean is cumulative impacts. And cumulative impacts happen when there's no planning, there's no stopping, there's no limits as, as to it. Um, so you need the limits and you need to say, this developed hit a limit. Um, and sort of finally the other area that I think um, is a new normal is the upsurge in the circular economy and really that, that's a shift that we've got to have responsible consumption uh, sorry Andreas are you giving me the thumbs down no I'll, go, I'll look at you Matt 
Um, so I'll, I'll end on that note. Circular economy mean it really means to reduce waste. Stop with the take, make, uh, discard mentality. Uh, reduce waste, and, and it, it's a longer seminar. It's a seminar on its own. But that kind of thinking is the new way of signing a new contract with the oceans. Thank you. Thank you, Russell. Well, a seminar on its own. That sounds like a that sounds like a commitment we won't not, might uh, take you up on another day. So there was also a, a set of questions around uh, fisheries and, and lots of questions for for Dr. Safri. Um, many questions, in fact. Holudin asked, uh, "What will fishery management look like in the new normal?" In, in specifically in the Indonesian context. And, and Dr. Safri, there were, there were also, while well, you're answering that question, there, there are questions about what shall we do around um, production and export and how to, how to increase production and increase export to generate the revenue. And I think that the, the context to those questions is, is to do that while respecting the limits that the ocean has. Um, over to you, Dr. Safri. Thank you, Matt. Uh, when we're talking, the, the, the data show us that the, our production is increased, but the price is decreased. This is the data. So the government now it, uh, was jumping to the, uh, this issue, how to uh, support the, 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 what's called it, to aid the, the, the fishermen. First is about it's mean to increase the number or increase the, the capacity of the cold storage. Because if the production is still high, but the, the market the, the, is, is still low, and the, the problem we are overstock, and uh, they have limited, uh, limited of the uh, cold storage. So we mobilize the transportation, we give some, uh, some what's called a stimulus from the finance that, that, the, that we make the half price, how to make from the eastern part, the Indonesia, to go to the western part. Because the, the market in international market is slow down, so why we we need to increase the, the domestic domestic market. And the second thing is it, it we to increase also the number of the, the the capacity of the online market. So there are so many startup now to involve the how to make how to marketing this product. As we understand also because the COVID nineteen pandemic we have some limitation. To the people to go to the market, especially the traditional market. So online has become so what's called so uh, it's very fast at the growth. So I did. And the third is how what about we asked for the the state owned company, if there is the abundance of the fish product, so we asked them to buy. It's be it's like the function is like a bullock in the uh, what's called a food crop, but this uh, for the uh, what's called the rice and this is for the fish. So we but they still need more the cold storage. This is like like a chicken eggs. So they, they we give the authority to the uh, state-owned company of special for fishery, like Perinus and Perindo, to buy the, the abandon the, because there are so many product of the fish, especially the capture fish, but the market is limited. This is the part of and so forth. At the same time, we also to uh, simplify the regulation for investor, especially want to make industry because there are so many raw material. So we need to simplify before the, the regulation is about 21 regulation. If we want to, we want to simplify until just five, something like that. This is a part of how to, you know, how to the government give a policy so the, the people can interest to do this business. Of, of course, if we're talking about the new normal, I think now we already new normal. It's not usual we, we make a seminar like this. Normally we have to face to face offline. But because the pandemic now, the webinar is, is become the, is become, I think it's, it's become normal now. So many, many seminars become webinar in the, in the future, it's normal. And this is also part for the fisheries, fisheries industry. We understand also the fishery industry in the next time, because we also, we still keep the social distancing in the market. Of course, now more the marketing we will propose by the what's called the, by online, and then when the fish are coming to the uh, to the city or to the fish port before they arrive, they can inform their product what they catch today, and the the market can share before they arrive. This is a part of the technology, how they do it, how the what's called in the 
uh, we provide the the COVID-19 pandemic to make the, the marketing more 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 more, uh, uh, what's called, uh, more more easy. That's smart. Hello. Thank you, Dr. Safrian. And certainly the example you gave of the portable cold storage was, I, I thought that was a, a great example of, of innovation to uh, address um, some of the local scale impacts of, of COVID. So I don't want to take all the questions. Andreas, did you want to choose a question from among the many? Yeah, there are many questions coming up and it seems like very, uh, enthusiastic uh, audience coming and one question is uh, asking about uh, uh, can we uh, can our economy return to its original state or especially related to the ocean uh, blue economy and can you explain uh, I mean the, when is uh, will be the return timeline for this thing? Maybe there some expectation, uh, hoping that we could able to recover this uh, in the near future, something like that. This question maybe to Stefanos and to Karen, and as well some people are asking about um, how to uh, to anticipate uh, no one left behind of the pandemic here what the government need to do uh, in order to minimize uh, someone left behind something like that. Thank you, man. Um, if, if you don't mind, should I uh, start? Because I also have to excuse myself in about five minutes and I plan for another meeting. Um, I think address that to leave no one behind, we need to start focusing on the ones uh, that, that are the most vulnerable. I think when it comes to issues like the recovery of the COVID pandemic and uh, relations to the ocean economy and the climate, these uh, coastal communities are artisanal fishermen, uh, uh, people working on small and medium enterprises that they do um, depend on, on the ocean. And I think that we need to listen primarily to the needs of these people to see how the crisis has affected their employment, their social security status, and the way that uh, interact in their daily life. I think that, um, I mean, it, it's not that we need to reinvent the wheel. Uh, we need to reduce the inequalities and increase um, the access to services. I think that it's a little bit more than ensuring uh, that we don't have income losses. Uh, income is not the only uh, determinant of poverty. I think a much bigger determinant of poverty and of social exclusion is access to social services and access to opportunities. So I think that if we focus on ensuring that uh, the people that uh, they are the most vulnerable, uh, they do have access to opportunities and access to services, uh, we have a big step. And um, again, let me say that uh, it is about coastal communities, artisanal fisheries. Uh, don't, we should not forget uh, migrants also, which are becoming a big part of the, uh, of the, of the question. Um, and I think that we do know who are left behind. Uh, we just need to make sure that when recovery plans are, are designed and implemented, they do have a saying and we do understand what exactly they want. Because sometimes when we are planning uh, by doing desk studies only, uh, we might know the theory of what it means to be left behind, but we, want, we don't know what exactly these people are facing in their daily lives. So I'll, I'll finish with this. Uh, sorry, Karian, that um, I stepped in before you, but I, I was a little bit pressed with time. Thank you. Not at all. <laughs> uh, Luz, thank you very much for, for the question. And um, look, I, I, I mentioned a, a few things that we, we were working on um, and that I think are a priority. First and foremost, of course, no one left behind in terms of the health network, the health system and country that is there, that is not overwhelmed and that is able to care for the citizens of um, every country, right? We're seeing instances where countries are responding quite well and quite effectively and flattening their curve in other countries that haven't. In the Pacific, in the unique setting of the Pacific, COVID has not arrived in, in 10 of the countries. 
And so one thing that um, we're working with um, uh, governments now is providing them with the resources, um, both the equipment, the good, the cash resources they need to purchase the volume of equipment, health equipment, to be able to ensure that they have a strong health sector should the eventual sector um, resourcing that is needed and infrastructure that is needed to ensure that no one is left behind from a health perspective, right, which is that first immediate shock. The next shock that is also happening right now in tandem is the economic shock. And so part of what, what we're doing and part of what we're working with our clients is look at government spending, look at public spending through resources that we and others are providing to provide a cash buffer to those who have lost their jobs quite suddenly and lost their livelihoods, right? So, so there's a quick shock right there. They need resources to be able to purchase the basics of, um, of their life, right? To continue their livelihoods um, and to be able to buy food and other resources, fuel, food, um, and medicine, for example. So, and to ensure that they have a home um, and, and have the basic resources to live their lives. Um, we also, in tandem to that, we're looking at how do we create local jobs for different skill sets. So in many of the Pacific Island countries, there is a, a, a large population of, of youth who don't have employment opportunities. And so what are some ways that we can create jobs uh, domestically right now that don't, that don't depend on international travel or international transit or export of commodities? So we're looking at job creation. We're looking at cash transfers to buffer the immediate shock of job loss um, and lockdown. We're looking at strengthening the health system. So this is something that the public sector can do immediately, um, working with the private sector, creating new uh, and innovative jobs. And this is why I was touching a little bit on the blue economy and looking at different subsectors, for example, the, the example that I gave in Christmas Island in Kiribati, where we're looking at how do you strengthen the sport fishing when that begins again? How do you how do you really strengthen different parts of that economy and create new jobs on island that local citizens can uh, partake in? So definitely jobs, definitely cash transfers to, to buffer this and bridge this period of immediate shock, supporting livelihoods and making sure that the coastal resources in particular are not degraded further but they are met there continue to be managed sustainably so that coastal communities can still benefit from use of those um, coastal resources in a responsible way. Um, and so, and so these are some examples of how we uh, at the World Bank are helping communities to not be left behind from a health perspective, from an income perspective, and from building that bridge into the future into a post COVID world or a COVID world because this virus is likely to be with us forever. And so um, what would be some ways of ensuring that the economies and people's lives can go forward and minimize the adverse impact? I hope that answers uh, the question. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Karen, for the explanation. I think uh, we are just uh, almost to finish the uh, uh, just running out of the time, uh, maybe for the closing uh, I would like to ask to all the panelists to give uh, some uh, few words, conclusion about uh, what actually the next step, uh, the immediate uh, action need to be uh, done by us. It means not only country scale, but also the people who who have interest on the ocean or blue economy in general. Uh, I would like to start with the Stefanos, are you still there? Maybe he's already have a meeting. Yes, I think he had to leave, Andreas. Okay, uh, Pak Safri. Yeah, uh, Andreas, I just want to ask, I would call it, uh, say something, because when we're talking about blue economy, blue economy is something, it's a new word for some people. So we need to socialize, especially local government. They know about the environment, they know how to make it, the, what you call it, uh, balancing, they know how to make it the, 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 the other, what you call it, the, uh, I, I, the sustainable, but
but we we will make it is one packet if you call it a blue economy so i i think the blue economy this you we need to socialize more and more especially to the local government because it's important if you want to this concept is become a success in the next at least five ten years later this is important thank you uh, russell can you give some words yes um for a message to everybody still um, with uh, COVID-19, follow the health advice and uh, you, we need to stop this virus to, uh, to levels we can manage. So that's, that's just, uh, please, you know, um, uh, follow the science and the advice of the health experts. Um, the second one is um, think about new ways to um, look after both the community and people's health, but also the environment. Uh, so there's a lot of ideas and find the experts in your communities. Uh, and if you are an expert in, in a regional area, um, find a way to communicate the, the, the knowledge of uh, environmental sustainability, waste reduction and a healthy environment it means a healthy economy and a healthy people. So um, that's just a, I had to put the first one in because it's not over yet. Thank you. And Andy, Steve, Arian, can you say something? Thanks, Andreas. Look, the message I would leave um, everyone with, and again, thank you for, um, for joining and listening, is really that um, we have uncertain times ahead. We don't know what that new normal is, but you know, if we, I think we really need to look for the opportunities um, in this pandemic and how we respond. So, I mean. The degree to which we can also use this to reset the agenda around addressing climate change, around addressing sustainability, is, is we want to encourage everyone from government all the way through to um, individuals to put that into practice um, and really take that opportunity. Thank you. Thank you, Andreas. Yes, yes. Look, uh, I've, I've mentioned a little bit before, but um, thank you very much for, for uh, having the opportunity for me to speak on this um, panel. Um, I think, you, you know, as, as other speakers have said, look, we're, we're still at, at the beginning, right? We're still in the midst of this. We don't know what the future holds. We don't know when travel will open up and what it will look like. I would say that um, where we have an opportunity across the board is coming up with uh, clear ways of ensuring that as we build back these economies, we build it back better, we build it back more sustainably, and that we ensure across the blue economy, as Pasafi has said, really socialize that concept of blue economy, the living and the non-living side of the blue economy, and ensure that all of the actions that we take as institutions are really couched and anchored in sustainability principles, and ensure a very blue future for this planet and for those economies going forward. So if we can, as a collective group of individuals on this, this webinar today, it's over 600 people, if we could come up with the best ideas for building back better, I think that would be the way forward since we're really in the unknown. Thank you. Thank you. Matt, can you have some words, Matt? Thank you, Andreas. Um, I, and I think all I can do is is echo what's been said. I think the the advice coming out from the World Health Organization overnight is that this isn't over. Um, the epicenter of COVID might be shifting uh, around the world, but there isn't uh, anywhere in the planet that uh, is is immune right now. So um, while we while we wait. Um, and uh, hope for the vaccine. I think we can plan and, and we can plan with some of the ideas that the speakers have um, shown us today. We can plan on, on thinking about what a new contract might look like, for example. We can plan on, on thinking about how to respect some of the, some of the limits, some of the limits that, of what nature can give us um, because I think collectively we will we will benefit. Uh, there's some things that we can do in the in the short term, and, and Kerry Ann's mentioned some of those in terms of um, uh, using using finance, for example, to support those in need. Um, using using innovation, as Dr. Suffrey's uh, pointed out, to, to help to help with with some of the pain points, some of the some of the issues that that uh, need immediate 
need to be immediately addressed. But we, we should also, as, as we work through, uh, we should have our, our eye on the, on the horizon and say, and, and think about, well, what do we want the world to look like when we come out the other side? Um, so, terima kasih. Um, thank you, Andre. Thank you, uh, uh, Matt. Thank you for our speakers, our panelists, for giving us some information. Uh, we have several issues here, but uh, some of them are tied to meet between uh, climate change issue and the blue economy and the COVID. Uh, I think we know that the uh, unwise of globalization uh, caused the climate change, but the, the COVID could create the globalization. So another way of the uh, globalization. So I think uh, this is uh, still a big mystery in the near future, still going on, and we are hoping uh, that uh, some information coming from the experts here could uh, increase our awareness. And then the important thing is about the action, how is we could able to prove our uh, real action in the near future. Thank you to all panelists. Thank you to the, all the audience, uh, over 600 participants from the uh, direct in the Zoom and as well to the YouTube live streaming. So thank you for your attention. We are hoping we can meet for the next uh, international maritime webinar. I think we will have uh, another meeting about next two weeks. I will let you know about this information to the, our uh, your networks. Thank you very much for everything. Thank you for coming to this webinar. Bye. See you later. Thank, thank you, Andreas. Thank, thank you, everyone. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Andreas. Thank you, Kerry. Uh, Thank you, Matt. Thank you, Michelle. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.